uh, with regard to the Assassination Records Review Board, I have nothing but compliments for their work. It was uh, very thorough and painstaking, the disadvantage being they don't know how much material was there to begin with, and therefore they would not know how much would remain after their heroic efforts. But uh, I am in awe of Judge Thunheim, whose integrity and dedication to this project was instrumental in making it a success. He mentioned that he was sure they didn't get everything. A striking example is when the ARRB indicated to the Secret Service that they wanted copies of their presidential protection records for JFK motorcades. Instead of turning them over, the Secret Service destroyed them. I can't imagine a more striking indication of consciousness of guilt. Plus, the CIA is to this day engaged in a an action to withhold records for a key operative, their director of psychological operations, George Mohammedis, whom Bradley Ayers has identified from photographs as having been at the Ambassador Hotel along with several other CIA officials. And given the obvious extent to which this would fall within the scope of the JFK Records Act, it has to be regarded as a matter of the greatest urgency to the CIA that those records not be released. Uh, and, of course, the, quite appropriately, the ARRB is going to get all documents available into the records, whether they are forged or faked or not. In fact, the forged, faked, and phony documents can be extremely significant, just as in the case of the exposure of the false claims that uh, Saddam was trying to obtain yellow cake from Niger were exposed by Ambassador Joel Wilson, which led in turn to the heavy, punitive, vindictive exposure of his wife, Valerie Plame, as a covert CIA agent who was in fact responsible for what I take to be the most important intelligence network in the American intelligence community, namely one that was seeking to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons, including in the Middle East. This just tells you something about the character of these people in an administration who would be so brazen as to describe itself as the security administration or Bush as the security president. More about Yohamides is mentioned in Brad Ayer's book, The Zenith Secret, where he met, as I mentioned, a number of these people down in, uh, when he was with J.W. Wave in, in Miami and involved in gun running and other operations against Castro and as an army officer assigned to the CIA. Important book and fits together with a lot of other pieces of the puzzle. As far as Gary and John's work is concerned, I think it's terrific they're pursuing this. It's entirely possible that the Zapruder film may have been reworked after it came into the possession of Life magazine. For example, Dan Rather reported after viewing the, the film on a Saturday morning after the assassination that Jack Kennedy fell forward. When the, the extant version of the film, which you've seen here, was finally shown uh, in 1975 when Robert Groden and Dick Gregory got it onto Geraldo's program. He was widely ridiculed because this back into the left. But as David Manick has observed, uh, none of the witnesses reported that back into the left. And uh, Dan Rather may very well have been right that Jack fell forward. In fact, my take is after being hit in the back of the head, he fell forward. Jack eased him up, was looking him right in the face when he was hit in the right temple with that frangible or exploding bullet. I started to mention, by the way, that the cause of death was three parts. Bob Livingston, the world authority on the human brain, explained to me that the cerebellum it has it's covered, this compact part of the brain at the base is covered by a tough membrane called the tentorum, and that if the tentorum had not been already ruptured, that even the near simultaneous impact of a shot from behind and in a frangible or exploding bullet to the right temple would not have been sufficient to, to blow out cerebellum so that he believed that the bullet that hit Jack in the throat fragmented part went upward and ruptured the cerebellum, another part went downward into the lung, and that, therefore, the cause of death really was an effect of all three of these shots. The, the, the fourth, of course, that hitting Jack, the innocuous one to the back five and a half inches below that, that Gerald Ford had re-described. John uh, Armstrong has done a huge amount of work on Harvey and Lee. His theory is almost preposterous on its face because he describes two persons having parallel lives with similarly named mothers and all this stuff and it's, it's been very hard for me to appreciate to what extent he can be right about this but he has a massive load of documentation to support it and it can't be casually dismissed that there are multiple imposters for Oswald is unquestionably true there were 
trivial cases in Dallas where uh, someone uh, went to, uh, to try out a car to see if they might want to buy a car and drove the, the dealer at high speed so he was terrified and then when he got back to the lot just was dismissive and said, oh, they have better cars in Russia. This is an obvious attempt to create an impression of an, an Oswald who, from all we know, actually didn't know how to drive. Plus, another was out on a sh shooting range and was firing on the wrong target. And when the guy complained that he was shooting on his target rather than his own target, the Oswald impersonator said, oh, I, I thought that was, I'm sorry, I thought it was Kennedy. So, you know, I mean, these, these were so blatant and so obvious, no one could mistake them, I think, for the, for the real deal. Plus, of course, we have the Mexico City trip where I'm utterly convinced this was completely set up, sending someone down there to try to get a visa to Cuba to reinforce this image that it was a pro castroid so that when, they, when he was finally picked up, see, when he's nailed for the assassination, then the, the, the country is supposed to rise up and insist on crushing Cuba with our military force. The, the, the committee that was misidentified, by the way, where Jack uh, Ruby corrected it, was Free Cuba Committee, which of course wanted to free Cuba and, and change American attitude to, to free Cuba from communist domination and get rid of Castro. Whereas uh, Oswald was uh, handing out pamphlets for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, which of course wanted the U.S. to have a more even-handed policy toward Cuba. Uh, there is a reason to believe that there may have been two, a different Oswald in Russia, however, and a different Oswald in the United States for the following reason. Some of the photographs of this, Os this Oswald in Russia look to me very, very different. And this guy was reported to be a marvelous conversationalist. I mean, you get these two, these, these reports of this marvelous conversationalist, this guy who is fluent in literature, history, politics. Somebody who was great in, at discoursing, and I tell you, the guy who was arrested at and, and then the police department and all that was semi-inarticulate, you know, even when he goes on the television or radio program in New Orleans and talks about the distinction between being a Marxist and being a communist, he, he has a very hard time articulating. So I find it very difficult to believe, as a philosopher who deals in language for his profession, that these are the same, same person. As far as the men who killed Kennedy, Part 9 is concerned, absolutely right. There's a lot of corroborating evidence for what uh, Madeline said about the event at the, the home of Clinton Murchison the night before, and for additional evidence uh, implicating uh, Lyndon in the assassination of, of JFK. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 